Thanks very much, Peter, and thanks very much to, to Sport Force for inviting CPRE here this evening. Absolute privilege to be here on the platform alongside a number of very other high quality speakers, a, a really good programme that you've assembled. And also, it's a particular privilege for me, for me to be here because 11 years ago I was here as part of my planning course, and it was really good to meet a couple of my lecturers from 11 years ago, again, who are here this evening. So, so re really good. So, so that's the. Uh, that's the statement at, at the at their opposition. It's taken from our 2026 vision for the countryside. And you'll be able to see from that that my job this evening will be to persuade you to put your vote in the urban intensification box. But just to say a bit more about that. The question, I think when you were considering this question about where will our grandchildren live, it's important to think of the question as well of where will our, what will our grandchildren eat as well. Because at the moment we grow about 53% of, of the food that we eat here in this country. And one thing that is certain is that when we've got global trends of population growth, climate change, growing pressures on land, we need to use the land that we have in this country more wisely. And we need to think very carefully about about what, how we use it, how we protect our farm, farmland, alongside building the new housing that we need. And there's a lot of nonsense being talked about people, by people who should know better. For example, a well-known academic who's, whose name shall remain nameless says that intensive agricultural land has no environmental value. But, but clearly, if you look at it in the wider picture, the, the farmland we have is hugely valuable and the countryside we have is hugely valuable, not just for farming, but also as a place for nature as well, a place where we need to make more room for nature. Do, just before I go on, who has heard of CPRE before? Good. But most of you, that's, that's encouraging. Um, so we, we were formed in 1926, national charity... These slides hope will be made available and you can find out more about us on our website. So on the current context, uh, I think probably other speakers will also talk uh, about these issues as well. So I will not dwell on these for too long about how much housing we're building, how much we need. And certainly I'd agree with the, the points that Peter made at the start, that there is a, a crisis of affordable housing in this country and access to housing and clearly we will need to build more much more new housing to deal with this problem but but one statistic i would leave you with is that according to government figures that there were about 22.1 million households in this country in in 2011 according to the 2011 household projections but there are 22.9 million houses or dwellings so so, so there, is a, there, there is some real discrepancy there already. So, so although, as people will rightly point out, we're not building enough housing to meet needs as, at present, we're not starting from a baseline of shortage. And what that means is, is that we shouldn't have to accept the views that people put to us, that we've got to suddenly grant more and more planning permissions very quickly and we've got to hurry up and get local plans in place yesterday. Because actually, we, we've got more time than that. We can actually do this properly and actually plan for the longer term, and actually get development that our children and grandchildren will be proud of. So as I said but, but, earlier, but for CPRE, a, a, key part, a key element of addressing the housing crisis is, is actually making best use of the land we already have, the, brown, the brownfield sites we already have. And we're looking into this issue at the moment. We estimate there's a... Uh, there's a, at least enough brownfield land available for, for a million new homes across England and probably quite a bit more than that. And does anyone know this site on the left? <coughs> yeah, that's, that's Ke Kendall Street, I believe, it, here in the centre of Leeds. And that's actually been nominated by a member of public for our campaign Waste of Space, which is currently running on our website. There's more details of it there. And... What we're asking people to do is actually write in and tell us about the brownfield sites they know about in their area, which could actually be better used for, for new housing development. So, so if you haven't already seen this, please do 
have a look at the website and write in if you know some sites that you think could be better used but are actually going to waste. And, and across Yorkshire and the Humber, there, at the last count, there are, there's enough brownfield land available for at least 70,000 new homes. And brownfield land doesn't run out. There's a constant churn of it because more becomes available all the time when uses change, when shops become redundant, when, factory, when factories aren't needed anymore, or where, or where more and more people are working at home. So, so we can make more use of brownfield land, but we also want to see more done to unlock the obstacles. More needs to be done there. The government talks about local development orders, for example, so the council's granting planning permission, doing all the work up front with the developer rather than accepting an application planning permission. That could help, but there is a lot more that, that can be done. And I think another point to bear in mind as well, I think, again, this is another point that, that Peter made, which is probably going to be a running theme and is something that's really important to bring out. So certainly since the, uh, the financial downturn in 2008, we've seen more and more that the public sector is taking a, a key role in actually making sure that new housing comes forward. For example, in the neighbouring former region to this, the northwest region, in 2013, we've seen figures which show that actually about 61% of all new housing had some, that starts, had some form of public subsidy. So what Peter was saying about the greater role for the public sector is already happening to a very big extent. And as taxpayers, if we're actually going to be paying to boost the supply of housing, then it's right that we should be actually expecting good quality and we should be expecting <coughs> good bang for our buck. And, and using brownfield sites does a lot of that because it's actually, again, making best use of the, the schools, the other facilities, the bus services that are already available in urban areas. But also as well, it's making sure that we're protecting as much of our agricultural land as possible for future generations and we're not relying on food imports from countries that are going to become under increasing stress themselves. And, yes, yeah, so I will say, it, garden cities may play a, a role in the longer term. But again, it's not, it's not about this kind of obsession that many politicians have about getting it all done in five years, because no garden city that's been built in this country has ever, has ever happened like that. It's taken a lot longer. And have, have many of you been to Saltaire near here? quite a lot and, that, and that's a place that's always been a big inspiration for planners it certainly was for me when I visited but, places, but if we're going to build the new Saltaires, the places of the future the, the places that show a visionary approach to planning they will take time now, but one of the things that, that we've been looking at recently is, is, how, is ways in which you can boost the supply of housing, as the government said it wants to do, and is, as we said, there is clearly a need to do. And, and, and certainly Philip, who will follow me, will, will talk a bit more about the role of the big house builders. But at the moment, the, the big house builders are building most of the new housing in, in this country. And until, until recently, until about the mid-1990s, small and medium-sized house builders were building a lot more. And we should actually be doing a lot more to bring these players into the market so that it isn't just relying on a few, on a few large house builders who obviously build sites out at a time that is most appropriate for them. We actually need to get all these builders in the market. And, and the couple of examples here, that, that the site on the left is near Bridgewater in Somerset. This is, a, this is actually a new build by a small, a small house builder in a village just at, outside Bridgewater in Somerset. And the site on the right is... a is a good high density scheme in Bristol, which again was built on a brownfield site but also by a small house builder. Now, there are a number of obstacles that are currently to bring these into the market, but some of them are to do with planning in terms of getting the, the land, the smaller sites in particular, but also there's, there's key issues about access to finance as well and kind of higher relative costs of actually getting into the market. So, so we think there does need to be a focus not just on planning but also as well on the on giving more, more financial support to these builders to enter the market in the future. And we've done a report called Increasing Diversity in the House Building Sector, which is well worth a read and which I commend to you. So we, we are going to build more new housing, but at the same time, it's important to remember some of the key planning principles that, that have guided us and are still valid now. We've had green belts since the mid-1950s, but from our perspective, they're still doing 
the job that they were originally set up to do, and they're still hugely valuable in, in doing that job. <coughs> if we hadn't had green belts, then we'd actually have seen the sprawl that, that we see across North America and across most of continental Europe. And if London, for example, developed like Los Angeles had these past 60 years, it would have absorbed ha Brighton, Hastings, Reading, and all the way up to Oxford and Cambridge. But instead, it, London's actually stayed fairly compact, and we've continued to get more development within the urban area of London. It's, and overall, it's worked very well. And again, although some people say that not all greenbelt land is very good value, therefore you should build on it, it's actually important to remember that greenbelt policy has actually protected quite a lot of land that's actually of very good quality. There's a number of country parks in the greenbelt, but also as well, lots of woodland. Also, a lot of greenbelt is is very accessible, believe it or not. A lot of people argue against this, but actually there's a, there's a higher amount, of, higher concentration of public footpaths in the green belts around our town cities than, than you'll find in the wider countryside. So it's actually a huge, hugely valuable asset to the public in terms of recreation. But also when looking at these growing pressures on land that I talked about earlier, such as climate change, green belts also hugely important, and, not, and this isn't really understood as, a, as an asset for carbon storage, for water storage and also for protecting our water supplies. Two minutes. Across the country, it's unnecessarily under threat, and particularly in Leeds, we've seen that the core strategy is talking about building 19,000 houses on the Green Belt, so that was signed off a few weeks ago. And we think this is actually unnecessary, but because, again, it goes back to my original point. Planning policy at the moment is it's taking far, far too short-term approach. It's putting pressure on local authorities just to have this five-year supply of deliverable sites, but not really thinking about how we actually create better places in the longer term and, how, importantly, how we actually get communities involved in creating local plans and getting a proper say. As Peter said, a lot of people will initially oppose housing development, but neighbourhood planning has shown that if you actually give communities a meaningful voice, they'll actually promote more development in their area than was originally talked about. So... So if we get better involvement, it can work better. But, but also as well, we, we do need to, get, to have a more longer-term approach to planning and we need to use the brownfield sites first and make sure that we understand the value of our green belts, our undeveloped land, and we protect it for future generations. So you'll get all these sites separately. That will set out more detail about what we think about current planning policy, but that's what I have to say for now.